Welcome to my third devlog video on my 2D indie stealth Yeti game, whatever, all the keywords, all the acronyms. If you haven't seen the two previous videos, check them out. They're in the same playlist and it'll give you some background about this project. But this specific video is going to focus on player movement. So these are the six different types of movements my player can do. They can be idle, they can be running, throwing, creeping, hiding behind stuff or picking stuff up. In this video, we're gonna completely ignore hiding behind stuff and picking stuff up. That's quite complicated. And I'll focus on those two bits of movement in a separate video. But for now, we'll focus on the four. Idle, running, throwing, and creeping. As you can see, these are the four movements happening now. The Yeti is being idle by standing still. They are running when you hold onto the run button. And normally when you move, they'll be creeping. And if you press the throw button, they'll pick up some snow and throw a snowball. So let's talk about how these movements were achieved. And I'm gonna talk about three specific things. Packing sprites, loading the packed sprites into the game engine, into Hacks Flixel, and using keyboard controls to move the character and to make them throw a snowball. So, sprite and texture packing. This is an image of a game that I've made before. I've spoken about in a previous game devlog video, and the game is called Scales a pangolin story. I'll have a link in the description, but go ahead and play that if you have time. But basically, this image is the sprite sheet for the main character, Scales. And as you can see, it has all of Scales and movement, but it's not perfect, and I'm gonna explain why. Firstly, you can see there are a lot of gaps here. And this was done to focus on each kind of animation separately. So this first line is running, this is running into roll, this has been idle and so on and so forth. So each line focused on a different animation and it was easy to program it that way. This sprite sheet was created manually. So the artist, my wife, had to manually drag each frame into the sprite sheet, manually calculate how far they were apart. And even though for, for these round sprites, they don't take up a lot of room, the reason that there's a lot of gap in between them is because they can only be as big as the biggest sprite. Basically, this whole method isn't perfect. And if I wanted to go ahead and change a whole row of animations, I or the artist would have to change them and manually place them pixel perfectly in the grid that they were in before. Here, in contrast, is the sprite sheet for the Yeti character in the Yeti game. As you can see, this is much more packed together. They're rotated and they're a bit more random. So these tree animations for picking up a tree, they're not all together. The throwing animations are not all together. And there is some gap, but it's easy to fill them in if I wanted to, because this sprite sheet was created automatically. Nothing was done manually. I simply dragged the images that the artist, my wife had, had made, and this sheet was generated. Most developers, most 2D indie game dev developers, would probably use a feature or this, this program here called Texture Packer. And Texture Packer does exactly what I said. You give it a load of images in a zip or in a folder and it will pack them for you perfectly in a, a sprite sheet. The problem with Texture Packer is it's not free. It costs 40 pounds and this is a free year. There's also a lifetime cost, I'm not going to dwell on that, but £40 a year for Texture Packer, which is not too bad, actually. It's, it's quite cheap. But, I mean, we're doing this on the side. I'm not a game dev full-time. I don't get money for this, so I wanted to look for a free version. So I found this free Texture Packer. It does exactly what Texture Packer does. And I know this because I tried a trial of Texture Packer and I compared the sprites that that trial produced to the sprites that this free texture packer produced and they were pretty much similar. I mean, the texture packer paid version did have more features and created a slightly better sprite sheet, but this free one created a good enough sprite sheet for my game. Free texture packer is, is free, it's open source and the code is written in JavaScript. So if I wanted to go ahead and make changes, I, I could do that. And they also have a web UI version, which is the version that I used. And this is what it looks like. Now, what it creates is the image, which is what you've seen, the sprite sheet, but it also creates a data file. And this data file tells the game engine that this specific frame in the sprite sheet has been moved or it has been rotated. 
and the game engine can then translate that into a unrotated or can put it into the right set of frames for an animation and um, make it usable for, for the game. So now I'm going to talk about loading the packed sprite sheet into Hacksflixel. Luckily Hacksflixel comes with a helper for loading in packed sprite sheets. This supports certain things like texture packer and so forth. And luckily free texture packer outputs the same data file format as the paid for texture packer. So I could use this helper with the texture packer setting to load the textures in. This is the helper that I used. This is the helper code that I created to load in my texture packed file, as you can see, I'm using the FLX frames class with the from texture method. And I load in the image. So that's the packed PNG image and the data that the texture packer automatically generated. And with that helper, this is, this is how I loaded in the frames. Now, this is what a typical data block looks like from the free texture packer. It'll have the file name, the frame dimensions, if it's rotated or not, if it's been trimmed, and a few other bits of information. But the main thing that I used for my game to know how to lay out the frames was that each different frame had its own name. So as you can see, there's a, there's a creep with 05, creep 06, creep 12, and they're kind of in randomized order to pack the sprites in the best way. But I created a helper in Hackslixel to help me line them up, so unrandomize them and load them in an animation. And this is it. So I've got my four animations here, idle, sneaking, running and throwing, and I've got my helper function which will grab the five frames. So that's yeti idle underscore zero one, zero two, zero three, zero four, all the way up to five and runs them at this many frames per second. And this is how it operates for each animation or each bit of movement that happens on my main player. Okay, moving on to keyboard controls. And luckily Hackspixel makes this very simple. These are the inputs that I used, left, right, up, circle and cross. Now circle and cross, they're helpers for me personally because I'm a PlayStation player, console player. So I, I know where they are on the, on the controller. So if the game that I'm making is ever on a console, these are the buttons that will be used on the controller. This is how each button is loaded up in Hackspixel using this FLX Action Digital Helper. And I created a controls singleton. I've spoken more about singletons in another video. I will link that in the description. But the singleton essentially means I only instantiate the class once in the whole game. So this makes it better for performance. Okay, so with that singleton done, I can load the singleton up in my player class and I have added it to a variable called controls. With this variable, I can check if the left button has been pressed, the right button to cross all the circle, and I've assigned those to other variables that are global to use them in different methods inside the player class. And so this is my state machine. Again, I speak about state machines in another video that I have linked in the description of this video. If you're more interested in state machines, check that out. But different states relate to different kind of states of the player. So as you can see, I've got the sneaking state and the running state, and it checks if the player is pressing a button in the movement methods that are on line 106 and line 112. But also it checks if the run button is pressed on line 108 and if the run button is pressed, it'll move to the running state. If the run button is not pressed in the running state, it'll move to the sneaking state. And that's it. That is how the player moves in the game. It does seem quite complicated because it seems like I've made it complicated, but it's not that complicated. Player movement is super simple in Hackspixel. These are two lines, basically, if you ignore the brackets and you can move things around. But I've made a singleton to make it easier for me to go ahead and add controls to the character. It will make more sense if you watch the singleton video, but it's not that difficult. And with the combination of packing sprites, loading them in and loading character movements, it's made the game better overall because I don't have to manually change the sprite sheets and manually change frames. And it's easier to add new frames and load them in. So. If you are making a game, I would highly recommend using a texture packer, maybe a free one, maybe one that comes with the game engine you're using. If you are using Hackspixel, check out free texture packer. Don't worry about settings, use whatever setting you want, as long as the sprite sheet suits your needs. And go ahead and use the helper that I showed you to load up sprite atlases. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to add them to the comments in this video. I will see you in the next devlog video.